Welcome to the Oral Surgery Fight Club podcast. This is a collection of mock cases in the field of oral and maxillofacial surgery in a question and answer format conducted on Zoom. Enjoy. What's up? What's up? All right. There's just a lot to go through with medicine. Um, anything from hypertension, diabetes, bleeding disorders, transfusion reactions, psych, uh, all this stuff, uh, anesthesia. There's so many different ways they can they can take you down a rabbit hole. But again, they only have 12 minutes. So they can't take you too deep into a rabbit hole unless they want to know all you have to say on, you know, subacute bacterial endocarditis or something. Who is up first? Who we got? Hi, guys. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll I guess I'm in the hot seat. Yeah, hold on, let me share. Okay, you guys see it? Oh, yep. This one's going to be good. I can feel it. Oof. okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> let's do it. And the heart rate raises. <laughs> <laughs> That's part it's of it, man. <laughs> if, you can, if you can withstand this, you're going to get through the real boards just fine. This no, you're fine. It's, it's really, it's, it's, you're good. I'll be all right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, 50-year-old female presents to, your, uh, to you for extractions number 1315. It's, she is a self-prescribed, you know, severe dental phobic. What do you want to know? Um, so first thing, I want to get a history of present illness. Um, what's going on with these teeth? Are they painful? Are they infected? Um, was she referred by a dentist? Yeah, so um, she went to a dentist. Yeah, she is a dentist. Um, she went for like an emergency visit um she says that the the teeth just like all of a sudden kind of get the gums got real puffy real swollen and uh, she started having some some pretty severe pain from that area but no facial swelling um she's just, just she's just in a lot of pain mostly just like a little gingival abscess all right so first thing i'll get a past medical history medications allergies um past surgical history um and then i'll move on to a physical exam after that Okay. So she's a type two diabetic. Um, she's also hypertensive. She's on insulin as well as metformin and lisinopril. Um, she has no allergies. She had a tonsillectomy as a child. Everything went well with that. Um, no family history of any anesthesia issues. Uh, she has about a 20 year pack history. Um, and she occasionally drinks, you know, especially on the weekends when she goes out with her friends. Um, oops, well, the list is wrong, but she denies any of the list of drugs. So, um, that's about it. Vitals seem, I forgot to put those on there, but, um, her vitals, her blood pressure is a little bit elevated because she's so nervous. So she's, you know, 145 over 85 right now. Um, her heart rate is 85. Her SpO2 is 98% in room air. Um, and her respiratory rate is, uh, 18. Okay. Um, so I will, um, First, ask her um, in regards to her diabetes. Um, does she have a recent A1C? Does she check her sugars regularly? Yeah, so uh, she basically, she says that her A1C is like 7.5. Uh, she checks her sugars here and there. Um, she says that, you know, she used to be on one, one drug before. And, uh, and her doc like recently switched her to added another one. So which of those drugs do you think is like the first one the doc gave her? So I usually start with metformin. Um, okay. It's kind of a, a biguanide drug that uh, increase or decreases uh, glucose reabsorption in the intestines and decreases gluconeogenesis. Okay. Uh, it's working. okay. What can you tell me about hypertension? So hypertension is a uh, systemic um, vascular disease where it, um, with uh, chronically elevated blood pressures um, above 130 over 80 um, on independent readings. <clears throat> okay, tell me the different stages and uh, classifications for hypertension. So um, stages of hypertension. So norm normotensive is less than 120 over 80. Um, elevated blood pressures between 120 and 130, still less than 80 uh, diastolic. Uh, 
class one hypertension is um, 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, and class two is um, anything greater than 140 over 90. Okay, what would you consider hypertension? What's your cutoff? Um, so, I mean, <laughs> are you asking more about um, anesthetic wise, like what I get worried about or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so in an anesthetic, um, I think it's pretty normal for patients to be a little bit elevated in the dental chair. Um, but anything that's greater than I would say 160 over a hundred is where I start to get, um, a little bit concerned about poorly controlled hypertension. How does smoking contribute to hypertension? <laughs> um, smoking causes endothelial dysfunction, um, and, uh, increase platelet aggregation, um, basically just um, peripheral vascular disease. What are some of the risk factors or causes of hypertension? Um, so hypertension can be either um, essential or secondary. So essential hypertension risk factors are age, smoking, obesity, um, family history, stress, um, some of the secondary causes would be uh, pheochromocytoma, coarctation of the aorta, renal artery stenosis. Um, okay. Uh, what about her diabetes is concerning to you? Um, so anytime we're sedating someone with diabetes, uh, you want to know about their insulin regimen so you can adjust that as needed if she's needing to be NPO if you're doing an anesthetic. Um, an A1C is seven five isn't terrible. It's it's moderate control. Um, the fact that she doesn't check her sugars regularly is probably more concerning. Okay. And what are you concerned about with longstanding uh, diabetes? It's not popping up. So longstanding diabetes can lead to peripheral neuropathy. Um, your diabetic neuropathy can cause uh, or has a correlation between um, ischemic heart disease um, and uh, nephropathy in the kidneys. Okay. How does your diabetes contribute to hypertension? What's the mechanism? Um, so, uh, I'm not quite sure I'm liking out. Okay. And then uh, I think you answered this one. Oh, so the diabetes, and like I said, can cause um, kidney kidney disease, which inhibits um, the proper uh, regulation through the renin angiotensin system. Okay, so uh, what what questions can you ask her about her diabetes? You, I think I answered that one already about the sugars. That's kind of what I was going for. And then, uh, what does A one C tell you? What is it? So A one C is a glycosylated hemoglobin that. Um, kind of gives you an idea over the, the control over the past three months, roughly. Okay. And then, so, you know, she's, a, um, she, she has an A1C of 7.5. Um, she's on those two diabetes medications. She's hypertensive, but she's severely dental So what's your plan for this patient in terms of surgery? Um, so I think I would still classify her um, I think you can make a call to make her an ASA three, but I think I would probably classify her an ASA two in my office. Um, I would do this under outpatient general anesthesia. Okay. So what other options can you also offer her for 13 and 15? Other than you, know, so you can just do, um, extraction with local anesthesia in the office. Um, or, um, I guess if, you're not comfortable, you could take her to a surgery center. But like I said, I would, I would probably do this in the office. Okay. What level of sedation can she expect? Um, typically my, my patients, I, um, kind of hover between moderate and deep sedation. So, um, moderate sedation would be in which a patient still has, uh, intact airway reflexes and you don't have to, um, do any interventions to maintain ventilatory drive, whereas deep sedation, they can sometimes have uh, episodes of apnea or uh, decreased uh, airway reflexes. 
you answered that one already. Um, okay, so you get her fingers to glucose. See, it's 90. Any concerns? No, oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, what monitors do you put on the patient? So uh, standard ASA monitors, blood pressure, pulse ox, and tidal CO2, and a three-lead EKG. What staff are in there with you? So myself and uh, two ancillary staff that are BLS certified. Okay, so just only BLS, okay. Uh, you put on some leads, you see this. You tell me what you see. All right. Um, so normal axis, it looks like. Um, so you have a little T wave inversion in V2 and V3, um, which is a variant of normal. Um, the rate is about 80. Uh, Looks like she has a couple PVCs. Okay. And, uh, what medications are going to use for sedation? Um, so I use a combination of fentanyl, Versed, um, and then I augment it with propofol or ketamine, depending on, on the patient. But typically for her, I would probably start with a, a dose of three milligrams of Versed and 50 micrograms of fentanyl. Okay skip this one. Um, how much propofol would you give her? Um, I, I start with small bolus, so I'd probably start with 30 milligram bolus and see how she responds. Okay. How would you judge her level of sedation? Uh, it's a combination of her responsiveness to stimuli as well as um, kind of signs like sagging of the eyes or um, you know, and then uh, vital signs as well. If she says, ouch, during a procedure, what do you do? Um, most of the time, I just keep going. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I would reassess her level of sedation, see if she um, could benefit from um, additional anesthetics. Okay. And then, what is that one here? Um, local. Oh yeah, what type of um, what type of local would you use, and like, what's the maximum amount of light you can give this patient? She's so in a patient where I'm doing maxillary teeth, I, I typically use septicane, just articane. Um, the it's four percent um, solution, um, but if I'm using lidocaine, um, the maximum dosage um, would be seven milligrams per kilogram if it has epinephrine in it. So. What is seven times? What is that? Oh God, 560 uh, milligrams. Okay. I think they can ask like what well, carpules and all that crap too, if I'm not mistaken, but that's good. And then, uh, okay, so who recovers the patients? Um, um, so sorry. typically when I have a nurse in the office who will recover the patient. Um, They'll typically stay in the room for about 15 minutes after the anesthetic, and then we'll we'll take some vital signs. Um, we use a modified Algerit score um, to determine if they're stable enough for every turn to baseline before being discharged. Okay, so you're covering them, talk to the escort, and notice patients sleeper than usual, what do you do? Um, you know, I would give them a couple more, probably give them a little bit more time um, and see see if they recover. It's been 20 minutes, they're still sleeping. <clears throat> um, for a diabetic patient, I'd probably take the blood sugar and see see what that is. Um, is there anything else you want to do? Um, no, I mean, I'd maybe give them a little bit of stimulus, kind of maybe a sternal rub and see, see if they kind of wake up a little bit. Okay. Um, put some leads on. <laughs> You see this. Okay. So um, this is VTAC. So I would uh, check the pulse, check and see if the patient has a pulse, see if they're responsive. Um, hook up my other monitors, um, pulse ox, 
blood pressure. Okay. She has no pulse. What do you do? Um, so this is early defibrillation. So um, I would call, I would activate EMS first. Um, and then I would call for help, get the crash cart. Um, hopefully I still have my IV access. Uh, I would start compressions um, while I'm getting the AED set up. I would apply the pads and uh, apply or a, 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 a biphasic shock as quickly as I can. Okay. Other than shocking, what other uh, medications can you give? Um, so one milligram of epi um, every three minutes uh, during compressions. Okay. Nice. That was basically it. We went a little over time, but I just wanted to finish it. So good job. It's pretty good. I told you, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was 14 minutes, just FYI. Yeah. I went, that was a, that was I was a longer case. Yeah, a little bit longer. It was good. It was but good. That was really good, Colin. Good job. I mean, I feel like like this is something I took from the Nashville course. Like Dr. Um, Press kind of went over a similar case. And um, he went a little bit faster than I did in terms of like the questions and everything. Like he was just speeding through them rapid fire. But um just to kind of stay within that 12 minute time frame, but, but I don't know, I thought it was a good, like, case to kind of at least lay down the basics. Cause I feel like this is, this is, they're probably going to ask something like this. It's my thoughts. I don't know. It's hypertension, diabetes. Those are like the common things that we see in our office. Yeah. And then going into, you know, ACLS and everything with your sedation. And I think, I think you did like a really good job with explaining um, like the ideology of disease, the medications, um, kind of like how that all plays a role. Um, and then, you know, deciding your level of sedation uh, for the patient. Hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo, hey, yo. I got to sharpen my swords for the oral boards. I learned them from Mattel and he's the Lord. And I'm his protege. You know I'm going to slay all these motherfucking questions today. Because I got the sound bites. They're going to make these old men go, ooh, ah, like some afternoon delight. Yo, I got these questions in my sight and I got the answers. Yo, my answers is so ill. They give you cake or so Thanks for tuning in to Oral Surgery Fight Club. For uncut episodes and sound bites, go to osfightclub.com.